Hi. I have two confessions to make. The first is that I'm not Dutch. Sorry. I'm English, which is nearly as good. Um, and I'm still famous for my bitter balls. Um, my second confession is I'm not actually using Drupal at the moment. The last time I coded Drupal was in 2007, and I guess it's pretty different now. But I did tell them when they invited me, and they said, that's okay. There's always got to be one guy who doesn't use Drupal, and it's me. Sorry. I'm, I'm from Opera, the European browser um, that's made in Norway and Poland, and a mere 350 million people use it every month, and maybe you should try it. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the company. I'm here to talk about responsive images. This is something very dear to my heart because I kind of helped to invent it in uh, 2011. And it's just coming now, which shows something about the standardization process. Am I speaking okay? I know Dutch people are really good at English, so I'm not going to take any prisoners. So, responsive images. My name's Bruce, and I'm an HTML alcoholic, and I love the new stuff that's come in HTML. The new responsive image markup thingies is the technical term. The picture element, the source set attribute on image, this is new. The X descriptor, the W descriptor, and the sizes attribute. These are here to make your websites better than your competitor websites. This is kind of the, the latest frontier in responsive web design. If you're taking pictures by this evening, the slides will be online, and I'll tweet the link. Um, it's worthwhile remembering why we call it responsive. And in the Macmillan English Dictionary, responsive is defined as quick to react in the way that is needed, suitable, or right for a particular situation. So that's why we call it responsive, when it automatically looks like it was designed for whatever device you happen to be viewing on. But there's another part of this that we often forget, and that is quick to react. Speed is really important on the web. Uh, a 0 0.5 second delay in rendering is a 20% drop in traffic, Google tell us. A 100 millisecond delay is a 1% decrease in sales. Say Amazon. These are people who know their shit. One second delay causes 7% drop in conversions. Say Glasses Direct, the people who sent me these. A five second improvement in page load was a 5 to 12% increase in revenue, said Shopzilla. If you can make your websites work faster, you will get more conversions, more views, more repeat visits, and if it's the business of your website, more sales. And that means that your boss or your clients will erect a 10-meter statue of you in their car park and lay flowers on it every day when it's your birthday. Probably. The problem is images. Images are, of course, great. The image element was a non-standard tag added to HTML in, like, 92 or something like that. And, of course, if you're selling stuff, images are great. If you have a product, you want to be able to show that product in as high-resolution, high-def, big images as possible. But that comes with a cost. This, I took this screenshot last month when I wrote this talk. Um, so this is for March 2015. This is from HTTP Archive, and they run a web crawler across 10,000 different websites. And they concluded that the average web page is 1.9 meg, which is kind of pretty big and kind of pretty shameful, of which 1.2 meg is images. And images are getting bigger. This is eight years' worth of data. You can see that the number of image requests per page hovers around the mid-50s, but the aggregate size of request is going relentlessly up. Now, there's two reasons for this, I speculate. Reason one is that we were all used to 
ubiquitous broadband. Before we all started to get fascinated by mobile, we were all used to having faster and faster broadbands in our homes. I look back at my blog and the entries from 2003, 2004, I've got tiny little postage stamp sized images because on dial up, that took a long time to load. Now I have what the scientists call fucking enormous images on my website because I've got like a 120 squilli squillion gig line coming straight into my house. Another reason why images are getting bigger is the influence of Apple products, the retina screen. If you have double the amount of pixels per physical space, then mathematics tells us that that image will have four times as many pixels in it as a non-retina image. And this, ha this has been a, a question that we've been asking as a community since around Christmas 2011. How can I send super high quality retina images to retina devices, but not send super high quality retina images to old feature phones or non-retina devices? And we tried lots and lots of hacks, and we eventually concluded that you can't. And the reason you can't is our good old friend, the image element, has one source. It points to just one file. There's no logic here. There's no way to interrogate the device. I got experimenting, and I, I, I looked at CSS. And of course, CSS has media queries. So I tried this. I had an ID on the image called Lovely. The source was pointing to a picture of me in a mankini. I had uh, alt, of course, because blind people still need to know it's me in a mankini, even if they can't enjoy the full splendor of the image. And then in my CSS, I'd said, if I'm on a narrow device, replace that image with a low-res image. And that works. But when you look in DevTools, you will see that both of these are downloaded. It downloads this one, and then it downloads this one, which is exactly what we don't want. You'll also notice that I've replaced the little thumbnails with XXXs, because although this is the Netherlands, I don't know that you're all ready for a picture of me in a mankini. But after beers later, I'm wearing it, so we can talk. So, why do we get this double download? We have to look deep inside the browser, far deeper than the dev tools show us. Now, this is going to get technical, but uh, Imre and Peter assured me that everybody here is doing postdoctoral research in compiler techniques. Is that right? Anybody not doing postdoctoral research into compiler optimization? Not doing it? Okay. Put your seatbelts on, this is going to get technical. Inside your browser is a magical fairy kingdom. <laughs> Ruled over, it's full of pixies, image pixies, CSS sprites, SVG goblins. Ruled over benevolently from this castle by the browser fairy queen. All with me? Cool. Even the guys not doing the compiler optimization. And one of the Fairy Queen's jobs, when you first request a page, is to take your HTML and make a DOM tree. This HTML gets turned into that by the browser Fairy Queen. Once she's done it, she doesn't care about your HTML. That's why if you have a heavily scripted page and you view source, the source of the page might have nothing to do with what you're seeing. Because the JavaScript and the CSS is all actually running on that. Once she's turned this into that, that is gone. That's ignored. The original source is no longer required. Everything happens to this DOM tree. And it can take time for the Fairy Queen to make the DOM tree. So, in order to speed everything up, in order to get stuff on the glass as soon as possible, the Fairy Queen has image helper elves, right? As she reads through your HTML, 
when she sees an image tag, she will send an elf up to the server to fetch that image back, even before she started to make this. So if you have a big DOM tree, the, fair, the elves might already have got the images from the server before the fairy queen even starts to look at your CSS and JavaScript. This is why there is no CSS or JavaScript way to do responsive images. We've tried it, we've looked at it, but this process, which boring people call the preloader, this process means that you have to do this stuff right at the beginning in the HTML. I mention this because when I've done a talk like this before, angry people said, why all this new markup? Why not just do it in CSS and JavaScript? This is why the preloader will make it so that the images appear often before you can do anything with CSS or JavaScript, because the CSS and the JavaScript may not even have been fetched from the server by the time the images have arrived. And this preloader is a great optimization. A guy called Steve Souders, who runs a Velocity conference, and um, wrote a book called something like Faster Websites, like the Bible of Performance. He said, the preloader speeds up time to glass by about 20%. And Steve said, I think preloading is the biggest single performance improvement browsers have ever made. He doesn't know about the Fairy Queen. That's how it really works. But this stuff is why we need HTML. Cool? Cool? Great. So I got to thinking, how could we do this in markup in the HTML? And I noticed uh, a little known uh, part of the spec about the HTML5 video element has this. You can have a source that points to a low res video for narrow devices. And then if that condition isn't satisfied, it will grab the high res. This exists in the spec. This has been in the spec since about 2006, 2007. So I thought, why don't we repurpose this and make a new element for images? And as a straw man, I was a bit hungover because it was close to Christmas. As a straw man idea, I blogged this, and I called it the picture element. You can't call it I-M-A-G-E, because if you try this on your browser, if you type in I-M-A-G-E, it does exactly the same as I-M-G in all browsers. So we needed another word, and I thought picture. I didn't want to call it pick, because I hate those shortened names. But, um, and so I, I kind of speculated. We just use exactly the same syntax. And there were really good reasons why this was not a good syntax. But luckily, cleverer people than me were thinking about this at the same time. And they liked this idea, and they ran with it. We, or they, or a group of us, formed the Responsive Images Community Group, which was kind of, uh, the W3 said, OK, you can start a group up, but it's not going to be official, so we'll call it a community group. And basically, a group of us got to work on my picture spec and actually turned it into something that is coming to browsers now. And I don't want you to think that I'm trying to take all the credit for it. This guy, Matt Marquis uh, Wilto on Twitter, who works for Bukoop in Boston, he did most of the legwork, as did uh, Marcos Caceres from Mozilla, who has written many specs before. So he turned my straw man idea into a specification that browser vendors could look at and critique. A guy called Tab Atkins from Google, he managed to square some of the circles and deal with some of the edge cases. A guy called Simon Peters from Opera, for whom I work, try it, it's great. He, um, he's the guy who actually made sure this was completely progressively enhanced and completely accessible to people with disabilities. And finally, and most importantly, this chap from France, a guy called Joa Weiss, he is one of those rare people who understands the web and can write C++. So the community group, we had a crowdfunding exercise to raise 10,000 US 
so that Yoav could turn down client work and write the C++ for Chromium. We raised 15,000, which allowed him to write the C++ code and commit it for Chromium and WebKit. Uh, and this was the first time that a group of web developers had not only added things to the official specification, but got together and together, just as a community, just like you're a community, made it happen by crowdfunding and hard work and cross-browser collaboration the first time and hopefully not the last time, but it's the power of community. So let's look at the first use case that we, we, we talked about, optimizing for high DPI screens. This is how you can do it, and this is how you can do it right now in Safari for iOS, Opera, and Chrome. Right now, this is in those browsers. You can use it this moment. You just say, here is my image. This is the normal JPEG for non-retina screens. And then you have this new attribute, source set, and you say, if you have two physical pixels per device pixel, if you're retina, then use this high-res JPEG instead. The beauty of this is that it's backwards compatible because Internet Explorer 6 doesn't understand that, so ignores it, but Internet Explorer 6 does understand that and pulls in normal.jpg, just as it always did. Nobody gets a worse experience, and people with modern browsers get a better experience. This is classic progressive enhancement. And if your browser does understand source set, but it's not retina, then it will assume that that is the one times argument. Perfect. Nothing, nothing much extra, easy to comprehend. And you can extend that. So if you have three physical pixels per CSS pixel, you can grab super high res.jpg. Now, this is the point when people who are awake think to themselves, ah, but I have a device that is 2.5 physical pixels per CSS pixel. Which one will it use? And the answer is, you don't know. And the answer is, you will never know. Because you are not giving a command to the browser. And I want to emphasize this, so I've made a diagram so that you can remember it. Cool? <laughs> this boiled suite, this calendar, and this portrait of the composer list. You are not giving the browser a command when you give those different files, you are giving a candidates list, OK? <laughs> Thank you. I wrote that joke last time I was in the Netherlands. I don't usually like Dutch beer, but I discovered one called Yeneva. <laughs> it's not good after the fifth pint, but after the fourth pint, I came up with that joke. So thank you, Netherlands. But you are not telling the browser what to do. You are giving the browser a candidate's list from which it can choose. And the reason it's allowed to choose and you're not allowed to tell it is this is not you. OK? This is not you. Because you as a developer do not know the environment upon which your user is seeing your site. But the fairy queen inside the browser does know. So the browser has got complete liberty to choose from the candidates list depending upon what it knows. So for example, in Opera Mini, you might be using Opera Mini on an iPad on a high bandwidth situation. But you might have chosen image quality high, or you might have chosen image quality low. And if you've chosen image quality low, you as a user have decided that you don't really want the super high images. You want to conserve bandwidth, or you want to maximize speed. And therefore, the browser fairy queen inside that might always choose to grab the lowest quality image. Or in your browser, the browser might notice that you are in a low bandwidth environment. And so it might choose for this period of time only to grab the lower quality images. You can't know that as a developer, but the browser knows lots of stuff about its environment. And it 
can choose from the candidates list. The second use case for responsive images are stretchy images, responsive images. We've been using this. We've been saying all the images have a maximum width of 100 pixels, and we've probably said height auto if we're retrofitting old sites that have uh, height and width coded in the HTML to maintain the aspect ratio. And this has worked well for us, but a guy called Tim Cadlick uh, did some tests on some sites, actually quite a few sites, industrial grade sites, they are have it, they've got images that are six times the dimensions of the smallest screens that look at them. And by making the browser resize images constantly, you are taking time. And worse than taking time, you are using lots of CPU. And using lots of CPU uses lots of battery. And Bruce's rule of mobile development is, it doesn't matter how great your website is, if it hoses the punter's battery, they will not come back to your website. So some stats. On one test, one test page with six times images, it took an additional 278 milliseconds for Chrome and 95 milliseconds for Internet Explorer to resize images because you'd said max width 100%. This is a considerable period of time, and it's using up CPU, it's making the phone warm, and it's nuking the battery. So what you can do now is this. You can say, not the X descriptor anymore, this is the W descriptor. What I'm saying here is, here's a big image. It's 960 pixels wide. This is the image is 960 pixels wide. This is a small image, and it is 240 pixels wide. You, browser, you know the size that you need to display this image. So you can pick the one that is closest to the size that you need it, and then resize it to that. Because obviously, if you're resizing something from 250 pixels to 240 pixels, it's a much easier job than resizing something from 2,000 pixels to 240 pixels. Again, old browsers get that. Nobody gets a worse experience. Because everybody here is a responsible developer, you can put alt text on it just like you could before. And then for the browsers that understand this, you can give a candidate's list, and the browser will choose the correct image for the job. There's a spec change. There's a brilliant article on a list apart by a guy called Eric Portis, who was one of the Responsive Images community group. Read it, but he wrote it before the spec changed. Now the spec says you must put a sizes attribute, and by default it's 100 VW. This is a CSS length that stands for viewport width. In other words, this will show the image at 100% of the viewport width. But you can change that. So here, I'm saying, old browsers use that image. Everybody, this is the Oslo Opera House. Browser Fairy Queen, choose from these. This one's 200 wide, this is 800 wide, this is 1200 wide, this is 2000 wide. Choose the one that is closest to the size that you want to display it so that we hose the CPU less. And here I'm saying, if my minimum width is 640 pixels, therefore I have a wide screen, show the image at 60% of the width. Otherwise, show it full width. And this allows you to make genuinely stretchy images without doing gigantic resizing jobs on every image on the page. This is a bit of a pain in the ass. This is being built into Drupal 8 core as we speak. It's already in WordPress, which is what my blog runs. There's just a little plugin that you download, and it does it for you. Hand coding is a pain. This syntax can get nasty. The reason the syntax gets nasty is that it needs to be in the HTML so that it can beat the preloader. You can't do this in JavaScript. Another really useful thing that Responsive Images gives you is the ability to send different image formats. We know that as of January 2015, 
thanks to HTTP archive, 47% of images on the web are JPEG. 29% are ping. 22% are GIF. None of them are GIF because GIF does not exist. Thank you. And only 2% are other. But some of these other formats are much better formats. That is, they're more modern, they have better compression algorithms, so you get better quality of image at a smaller file size than PNG, JPEG, or GIF. But the reason they're only used by 2% of websites is because you can only use JPEG, GIF, or PNG reliably across browsers. A format that we use in Opera, and we've used it for a long, long time, is something called WebP. And we like this so much that in 2010, we introduced something called Opera Turbo, which will transcode images on the fly. So if you're on a slow network and you turn on Opera Turbo, we will transcode from PNG, GIF, or JPEG into WebP. Because even with that on-the-fly transcoding, it's still faster than downloading the original image. It, the compression is that good. Google use it for everything other than Google Maps. The reason is that they don't use it for Google Maps is every tile on Google Maps is made on the fly. They're not pre-rendered and stored, they're made on the fly. And WebP takes much longer to generate because it has much better compression. That won't matter when you're building a website because you'll just have a grunt task and you'll go away and have a cup of tea or a joint or something if you're in the Netherlands. And then um, you'll come back and it'll all be done. WebP, lossless images are 26% smaller than PNG. Lossy images are 25 to 34% smaller when compared to JPEG. This is a significant saving, and if you think about how many images you might have per page and the cumulative file size, you'll understand how much you could save just by coding them in WebP. But the trouble is, only Opera and Chrome support WebP. But I realized that HTML5 video already does this. HTML5 video already has the ability to send WebM to Firefox, Opera, and Chrome, and MP4 to Internet Explorer and Safari. So, because I'm unoriginal, and I prefer copying other people to thinking for myself, I just thought, why don't we do this for the picture element? So we have. This is what you would do. Picture, source, source set, tree.webp, and you tell the browser what kind of image it is. The reason is you can't rely upon file extension. Like sometimes JPEG is called JPG, sometimes it's called JPEG. You need to give it the proper MIME type so the browser knows and says, oh, I don't support that, I won't bother looking at that. If the browser supports WebP, it will show the WebP. If the browser does not support WebP, it will show the JPEG. If the browser has no idea what the picture element does, it will still show the JPEG. Nobody gets a worse experience, and browsers that have the more modern image formats get a better, faster experience. So your website downloads faster, people buy more stuff, and that statue of you goes in the work car park. Picture just magically changes the source of the IMG tag. It's just like a magical span surrounding an IMG. This is great because it means that the IMG must be there. The IMG element must be the last child of the picture element. Otherwise, nothing will show in any browser. This is by design. This is so people can't be testing only on the latest Chrome and forget to put the IMG and forget about older browsers. You will not see anything if there's not a fallback image. This is good. If you want to know which one the browser is actually showing, just check current SRC in JavaScript. The last use case, and because I'm not a designer, can you tell? Uh, I don't use very much, but if you are a designer, you will care a lot about this. 
is art direction. This is art direction. It's the same image, but on different classes of devices, you want to zoom in on a different part. You can't just zoom in on the center because, as any fool knows about photography, you go for the rule of thirds, and you don't put things in the center. There's no way to do this in CSS at the moment, but there is in responsive images. It looks like this. It's the picture element. You must have the IMG there, and you have the source. The source, if you are a really wide screen, show the full shot. Otherwise, show a close-up. So browsers that understand responsive images that are widescreen get the full shot. Browsers that understand responsive images and are narrow screen get the close-up. Browsers that do not understand responsive images, Internet Explorer 6 will still get the close-up and will still get the alt text. Nobody gets a worse experience and modern browsers get a better experience. This is progressive enhancement. So in summary, responsive images are good for resolution switching, width switching, alternate formats, and art direction. When? They're in Opera now. They're in Chrome now. They're in Firefox 38 in 12 days' time. In Internet Explorer, source set is in development and picture is under consideration. But if you follow the mailing lists, you will see that the numbers of questions that the Microsoft people are asking shows that it's very much under consideration. In Safari, source set X descriptors for DPI switching are available now because they invented it and we just absorbed it into the spec. It's in there in iOS 8.1. And because Safari is the North Korea of browsers, they've not said anything about picture. But like with IndexedDB and WebGL, one day they will probably catch up. Bless them. The Guardian, it's a friend of mine who runs The Guardian, this, he posted this four weeks ago. And he said, the Guardian has been using native responsive images for two weeks with no problems. They get 560 million page views a month, and they've been using it for six weeks. You can use this now because they require image SRC. Therefore, nobody gets a worse experience, and people with modern browsers get a better experience. You get a better experience because more people will buy stuff from your site because it will render faster. So, we all live happily ever after. Thank you, Val. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for a, a funny uh, last session and very informative. Um, are there any questions for Bruce? Over here. Um, how many uh, bandwidth did they save on The Guardian? How many, sorry? Bandwidth. It will save bandwidth. Uh, the, 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 it gives extra effort for you because you have to do more work and encode the images in more sizes. But in, in my opinion, if we're web professionals, we should make the extra effort for our clients and the users. There's a guy called Tim Cadlick again, I think his website is timcadlick.com, and he, no, Eric Portis, in a, li a list apart, he's actually crunched some numbers and some graphs about how much bandwidth gets saved by using this. It's a lot. You save a lot of bandwidth. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but Google Eric Portis, a list apart, and there are some hard numbers there. Did that answer the question? Kind of answer the question. There was another questions? hand. Mr. Hay. Bruce, thanks for the talk. Um, there seem to be two camps. Uh, the people who dislike X descriptors and want the W descriptors, and the other way around as well. Uh, like they're kind of a, you know, mutually exclusive. Uh, what's your take on that? They're not mutually exclusive at all. You can, there's an article that my boss wrote on dev.opera.com which is basically just a list of different use cases and copy and pasteable code. 
and you can get some gigantically ugly constructs that deal with, I want responsive, art-directed images that are retina-friendly. The, the markup is horrible, and I can't emphasize that enough. The markup is horrible, but hopefully I explained why it must be in markup. It can't be hidden in CSS or JavaScript because we need the preloader. But no, these, the, the, all of these different use cases are all combinable by design. Did that answer the question, Stephen? Uh, yeah, it was more, uh, well, I guess the, it's like there are two camps. You know what I mean? So people are against one or the other. And, you know, I don't understand, I guess, the, the animosity toward one or the other when you can use both or I neither. I don't. I'm, I'm against wind and I'm against rain, but it's a fact of life, so I just deal with it. <laughs> All right. That answers the question. Then. <laughs> Any more questions? Any more? Is there somebody down here? Yeah, Mark. I knew it was Mark. Of course it's Thanks. Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, so you've shown a couple of uh, examples using either the image tag or the picture tag. So can you explain like, more explicitly when would you use picture or when is the image enough? Any of those examples that only showed the IMG can also be expressed by picture. But I was ju I, I'm kind of, uh, I have a visceral dislike of too much code. The picture is just a wrapper. You must use picture um, if you want to switch between formats, like JPEG or WebP. And you must use picture if you want to switch between art direction. Otherwise, you can just use source set on the IMG tag. It, it's just a shorter way of doing it. Any, any of those can also be done with a picture wrapper. It's just it, it wouldn't fit on my screen. And also, I don't like too much markup. So the first two use cases, switching between DPI, like the X descriptor, you can just use image with source set. The second use case, which was stretchy responsive images with the W uh, descriptor, you can just use image and SRC set. The third use case of switching between image formats and the fourth use case of art direction, you must wrap them in the picture element. Because we need a pitch, we need something to wrap those different sources with the media queries on. We could call it pineapple, we could call it Bruce, I kind of fancied that, but they didn't have it. It doesn't really matter what it's called. We just needed an element that wrapped all of that construct together. And we called it picture because it's kind of what it is. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. If you follow me on Twitter or if you follow Drupal Jam, I'll tweet the links to the slides uh, tonight if I'm not too drunk or tomorrow morning if I'm not too hungover. So you can actually have all the... <laughs> so you can have all the code. Thank you very much. Bruce, I wanted to give you this as a thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Give him it. a big hand. <laughs>